Albertans are generous, compassionate, and intentional. And just like economic investment, when it comes to generosity, government can either be a help or a hindrance to Albertans as they work together to meet the needs in their communities. A good job is more than just paying the bills. It creates conditions favorable for people and families to thrive so they can lend that helping hand to their neighbour, to newcomers, or to those in their community who are less fortunate. Welcome to a special edition of the Cross Border Interviews. I am your host, Christopher Brown. Today, we have gathered a panel of guests to discuss the recent release of the 2023 Alberta Provincial Budget and want to know if municipalities gained anything from this budget. Our guests today include Alberta Minister of Municipal Affairs, the Honourable Rebecca Schultz, Alberta NDP Critic for Municipal Affairs, the Honourable Joe Sisi, Alberta Party Leader Barry Morishita, President of the Alberta Municipalities Mayor Kathy Heron, and President of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta, Reeve Paul McLaughlin. On Tuesday, Alberta Minister of Finance Travis Taves announced over $6.9 billion in investments to support municipalities. Today, though, we aim to examine the implications of this announcement and assess whether it will make municipalities better off. So let's begin this important discussion with our first guest. It is my pleasure to introduce Alberta Minister of Municipal Affairs, Rebecca Schultz. Minister Schultz was appointed as the Minister of Municipal Affairs in 2022. As Minister of Municipal Affairs, she is responsible for overseeing and developing policies and programs that support municipalities across the province. Minister Schultz, I want to start with the very first question right off the bat, and that is the premise of this entire special episode. How do municipalities fare in budget 2023? So in your opinion, as Minister of Municipal Affairs, how do municipalities come off in budget 2023? You know, I will say I think that this is a very positive budget, um, both for municipal affairs and for municipalities, but also for Albertans. Albertans do care that government is fiscally responsible and focused on securing our future. We, again, have a balanced budget that makes major investments in areas that Albertans feel really strongly about, like healthcare and education specifically. And then specifically for municipalities, we did make some changes that uh, I think were very welcomed. And the, the two specific ones, I would say, uh, really is uh, as we work towards the local government fiscal framework, uh, and that will be our new funding formula in next year's budget, recognizing the calls that municipalities uh, had asked for, which was really around changing the revenue index factor from 50 to 100 percent. So the feedback I got from municipalities was, look, if we are really, truly partners in prosperity, we want municipal revenues uh, to be, or municipal funding, sorry, to be linked to provincial revenues uh, at 100%. And our government felt like that was a very reasonable ask. And obviously that also does increase funding in the out years uh, under um, that new formula. The other things, you know, that I think have been really well received is uh, the doubling of the MSI operating. So that was uh, doubling the operating uh, funding. There's an Municipal Sustainability Initiative, the MSI funding, there's everybody talks about the capital, but there is also an operating portion. And just given the inflationary pressures that municipalities are seeing, that will be very well received. And libraries. Libraries are very important in communities right across the province. Um, I and my family are library users myself, but I had also had the opportunity to meet with the library boards and just hear how in communities right across Alberta, libraries are not just a place to get books. They're a place uh, where kids can work on their social and emotional development, uh, connect with other kids, where folks, newcomers to the to the province are going for support with their resumes and finding jobs. You know, seniors taking courses on cybersecurity and how to be safe online. Um, you know, the libraries really are a hub of their local communities, and they will see uh, an increase, and that increase works out to be 5%. We made sure every single library board will see at least a 5% increase. 
Now, you have been crisscrossing this province since being uh, uh, appointed as Minister of Municipal Affairs, and you're talking to municipal leaders just like I am in 2023. And I've been asking the, probably the exact same question you have. What is the biggest issue that is facing your community today? And now there's going to be a cross-section of issues that are facing their communities. But the reoccurring themes that I'm hearing on my show is growth, is aging mm -hmm. infrastructure, is housing. How does Budget 2023 address these issues and give municipalities a tool and resource to address the issues that are facing their communities today, like growth, like aging infrastructure? Yeah, and you know, that's, uh, I mean, really on the infrastructure side, uh, again, we talk about the MSI funding and that essentially bucket of capital dollars and what the LGFF is going to look like um, going forward. That's not the only um, allocation of capital in the budget, right? There are capital dollars under infrastructure, water programs uh, under transportation, and other, you know, road programs or road projects, sorry, under transportation. Uh, we've also had investments in this year's budget under housing, which you're exactly right. That is something that municipalities have raised. And I think Minister Nixon might be a, a better one to talk about how that program is actually going to roll out. But I think that those are good news for municipalities, uh, of course, and that's right across government. A couple of the other things that I talked about this morning, we had a, a meeting with all of the municipalities at Teletown Hall so they could call in and, and ask questions about the budget or give their feedback. Um, and I think that that was the one thing I tried to highlight is that, you know, there are fun, there is funding that exists under a number of different government uh, departments that will be exceptionally well received, whether that's school funding, uh, transportation funding, like I said, the water projects, housing, um, and also, you know, rural crime and community safety. And, and it's not just rural communities or urban ones. Community and public safety is absolutely a top issue right across the province. And so that's where I think this budget um, and the work that our government is doing to really stay focused on affordability healthcare, education, crime and public safety. These are issues that matter to residents in rural and urban communities alike. We all represent the same folks, the same taxpayers. And so I do think that largely speaking, the budget and the priorities of, of municipalities are aligned. Now, you and I will probably agree to disagree on this, but you can't please everyone in a budget. Not everyone is going to be pleased. Now, there are people on the other side of the aisle who will say that there's you, this this budget doesn't go far enough to helping the issues of Calgary residents, of Edmonton residents, of smaller communities like Alex. And I only say Alex is because I literally got that name stuck in my head right now for some reason. But how does this budget address the smaller communities as well? And does it leave people behind, in your opinion, or does it try to do its best in finding a balance that everyone can get that fair share of that pie when it comes to the MSI funding? Yeah, and so this year being the last year of MSI, again, the funding for MSI was front-loaded. And so what we're seeing is the last of three years of front-loaded um, funding for municipalities for infrastructure. Most of the discussions we've been having actually is around the new local government fiscal framework. So the new formula that we're going to use, this was something that municipalities had asked for, uh, essentially saying, look, you know, we need something that is transparent and fair uh, and predictable. And government said, okay, you know, that this was before my time as minister, but said, okay, you know what, you're right. We, we do need sustainable, predictable funding that is, you know, completely transparent and based on a formula. Now, ideally, and the former minister had said, we don't want as government to dictate what that formula is. So municipalities, can you please come up with a formula? Um, that didn't work. So we had one, one proposal come in from RMA, the rural municipalities, one come in from Alberta municipalities. We had another submission from the summer villages. And then we had a couple of other submissions, as you can imagine, from a few other communities across the province that didn't really think either one of those models really fit. So now my work is to go back and say, you know, I, I still really want this to be municipally driven. So can we come with a couple of options and have the rural municipalities, the urban municipalities um, come to the table and let's try to come to some consensus about what that will look like. 
The other thing that we do you think signal- you can get that done? I apologize to interrupt here, but do you think you can get that done in the next few months? Because you are in budget se- budget and election season right now, and who knows what's going to happen? But you, you're going to be going and presenting this budget to Alberta municipalities to the RMA. Mm-hmm. Do you think you can get that funding algorithm? fleshed out that everyone's going to come away happy in your short period of time before the next election. Yeah, I don't know exactly what the timing is going to be on that. We do have the meetings scheduled or we're working to schedule them for the end of this month so that we can have those discussions. It was really important that we had the budget come out first because obviously um, sometimes that discussion goes to the size of the pie. The size of the pie in the funding formula is now increased because of that change in the revenue index factor. Um, so the, the, I think it's a 12, just over a 12% funding increase from next year's budget uh, to the following year. So that's positive. That has an impact on the overall budget. Uh, the other thing that we committed to in this was to look at those municipalities, because obviously, while municipalities did ask for these changes, they asked for this framework. Um, once you actually have a framework and you put all of the communities and all of the factors into this formula, We then get a list, some of whom uh, in the municipal world, some will see, oh, we had, I knew that emergency. Uh, As we are speaking, the Alberta emergency (laughs) alert goes off on March 1st. So that tells you the date and time that this was recorded, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. So, um, oh gosh, what was I? Oh, right. So we're, we're going to have those discussions and and try to get everybody on the same page. But we had to make some of those initial dis- uh, decisions first. Um, you know, I originally thought, yeah, we'll have this formula out in the new year. And, and had Alberta municipalities and RMA been able to come to an agreement on one formula, that would have been easier. Um, but then, yes, just back to the transition funding is where I was going. Um once you put all of those communities and all of the factors from population to kilometers of local road to capital assets, once you put that in, you get that list of what each municipality can expect. And some raised concerns that eventually, anytime you do that, you're going to have some municipalities that see an increase and some that will see a decrease. We've committed to transition funding so that no municipality will see a decrease in that first year because um, we know that they'll need time to plan. I want to ask my last question before I let you go here, Minister, and that is, in your opinion, does do municipalities, rural, urban, all large, small villages have a partner in this government and do they have a partner in this budget? I would absolutely say that municipalities have a partner uh, in the provincial government. That's one of the things that the premier had really asked me to do was focus on building strong relationships. And not only do we see increases in the budget, Um, We've also seen commitments just to the way that we do work. I I think of the Calgary and Edmonton task forces that we've undertaken on public safety and mental health and addiction supports and how we're really saying, look, let's get everybody at the table. Let's be on the same page. Let's recognize the unique challenges and opportunities that each community has and come to the table for solutions. And, And that starts with relationships. I think it's reinforced in the budget. Um, you know, and I, I think that the other capital funding announcements, like I said, uh, support for FCSS, um, water, transportation, you know, roads, hospitals, schools. I, I think that this is an excellent budget. Um, but I mean, it also sets us up here in Alberta for what I think is a very strong future when it comes to our finances, putting down um well, paying down the debt and putting money away for our future. It matters in our households and it matters for the for the financial well-being of our province. But yet we're still making those important investments uh, in infrastructure that obviously matter to municipalities right across the province. So I think we've got more exciting work ahead of us. Um, but so far, the conversations have been really encouraging. And, you know, I'm just I'm fortunate to be in this role because it really is a pleasure to work with other locally elected leaders to try to make our province better uh, for all Albertans in every corner of our province. Well, I know I said it was the last question, but I'm going to just follow up with more of a statement <laughs> for, and it's more of a statement for you. What would you want municipalities to know about this budget that hasn't been talked about 
on the larger scale of things because you talked about libraries uh, at the beginning mm -hmm. of the interview. And I'll be honest, not a lot of people have talked about libraries when it comes to this. And I've been talking to a few people. But what other things about this budget and particularly yourself and in, in your role would you want municipalities to know? Yeah, you know, I, I think that, of course, outside of the funding formula and what the budget looks like in the out years, I mean, it is an increase of 42, 45, just over $45 million in our budget. Um, I, I do think it's important that we also talk about the Land and Property Rights Tribunal. Um, you know, that, that has been an issue in terms of keeping those um, decisions coming quickly. And just for landowners, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we we have a much higher, I would say, a higher volume than other provinces when it comes to that. I mean, we're unique here in Alberta, so we've seen an increase. Um, part of that is because of what we've seen in oil and gas the last couple of years. So, you know, an eight hundred thousand uh, dollar increase to the land and property to try, rights tribunal. I mean, that is going to be good news for for everybody. Um, and I I also just think it's going to be really working with. Uh, ministries like transportation and uh, seniors and community and social services, especially on the housing front and public safety and mental health and addictions. These are, I think, really going to be important budgets for, for municipalities um, to highlight or to look into. Uh, it's something that came up on our call this morning. And so I'll be doing some follow-up just in terms of making sure municipalities are aware of what's being offered through some of those other ministries. But it really is about being, yes, fiscally responsible and then investing in things that matter most. I mean, healthcare, for example, did come up on our call this morning. It matters uh, to communities if they want to stay viable that they have access or their residents have access to primary care and family physicians. Um, that matters. EMS, right? Th these are really important, uh, especially when we're talking about the viability of, of communities right across the province. So I think this is a great news budget. And I'm certainly proud of it. And so far, the, the feedback we've gotten from municipalities has been uh, very positive. I would like to now turn to our next guest, the Honorable Joe Cece, the Alberta NDP critic for municipal affairs. Mr. Cece is the current critic for municipal affairs and has been a vocal advocate for issues facing municipalities, such as property taxes, infrastructure funding, and community development. He has been a strong proponent of affordable housing, social services, and supporting local businesses. So, uh, Joe CC, MLA for Calgary, but also the uh, a critic for municipal affairs. I, I am posing this question because the show, the focus of our show is about municipalities. So, in your opinion, budget 2023 that was just tabled earlier this month, earlier this week, I should say, how do municipalities fare? Uh, badly. Um, you know, I, I just uh, have been going through the budget documents, got them at three o'clock yesterday, uh, trying to talk to stakeholders today and yesterday about what they're seeing here from their perspective, municipal people. Um, and there is not anything new here. Um, there is uh, the one big thing they all talk about is the municipal sustainability uh, init uh, initiative, MSI. Sorry, I, I to say infrastructure because that's what they use it for a lot but msi and uh it starts uh, uh regrettably for them it starts low uh and and escalates in the future so they're not seeing a great deal of uh, provincial support for their local municipal infrastructure which they leverage up with their own dollars to do more uh so that's a big uh loss for them that's a big uh uh setback for them um they they uh, uh would have been further ahead frankly with an ndp government uh because the thing we did was we worked with the two large cities city charter agreement we had in place uh that uh, started at a higher amount than this current uh year for um this msi and uh it it escalated uh, there was a what was it? Let's say escalator called um, a revenue a revenue escalator of one to one. So if the province uh, got more money, the municipalities would get more money for their infrastructure needs. Um, uh, so 
they frankly they would have been further ahead with us i i i uh, know for a fact uh that they're not happy with this uh so that's on one side they're also seeing continued downloading onto the local taxpayer uh for things like uh, the policing grant uh is being downloaded more there is uh, fine revenues are coming out of municipalities more as a result of the province taking more of that. Uh, the grants in place of taxes, which go for uh, paying the, basically uh, taxes for provincial buildings across the province that are in municipalities, is still not 100%. It's 50%. Uh, so all sorts of downloading. Uh, low amounts of money for the uh, MSI. Um, you know, if you look, people in municipalities across the province need schools, they need hospitals. You're not seeing those in this budget, uh, though the province, uh, the, the government will say, you know, there's 58 schools or or modernization is going to happen. We've looked. That's not true. There's not. Um, so, so I want I want to jump in on thing, in that statement though for a second because I've sure. been sitting down with local councillors and mayors for the, my show, and I've been asking them what oh, their really? biggest issue, in their opinion, is facing their community. Now yeah. I'm assuming, like you, you're asking that same question to local councillors, mayors, and Reeves. And what I'm hearing is growth, sustainable growth. I'm hearing about housing. I'm hearing about diversification of the economy. Does this okay. budget, in your opinion, in the Alberta NDP's opinion, set up the municipalities in any way, or is it a failure across the board, in your opinion? Yeah, the latter. Uh, it doesn't set them up for growth. I mean, people are coming here. Uh, we are growing as a province. We are going to be receiving uh, uh, migration from international migration across uh, Calgary, uh, across the province, across the country, and um, natural natural growth, births. There's no school, not enough schools are in this budget. Um, not enough health care is in this budget. Um, the the, uh, uh, the 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 big driver, a lot of big drivers, is oil and gas in this province. They're not seeing the infrastructure they need to be able to move around this province, uh, whether it's roads, whether it's uh, uh, municipalities having the capital dollars to address the needs in their communities that facilitates that oil and gas sector, facilitates diversification. So no, I, I would say that um, this budget is not set up for growth. And there was a perfect opportunity to address a lot of that with the significant budget surplus there was last year and the the, the forecast of about $3 billion this year in this budget. Um, you know, so what I, would you I, have wanted to have seen? What would the NDP would have, what would you have wanted to have seen or what would yeah. you have done differently when it regards municipalities with this budget, with the numbers that were presented with the, the surplus last year and the semi surplus this year, what would you have rather have seen? We, our MSI would have started at a higher amount and would grow with the, the economy. That's one thing. And that, and that's what you know, I was on uh uh, a meeting with the Alberta Municipalities uh, uh, Association a couple of weeks ago, and they gave me a presentation. They said, minimally, we want to start at $1.2 billion a year for MSI, and then we want it to grow after that. And so what you see in the budget is $445 million is what the UCP has come up with. So it's almost a third, 30%. Of of the the asks, which you know is pretty well documented in terms of where they believe it needs to go, Alberta municipalities and RMA, same thing. Uh, but you're only seeing thirty percent there, and then then a small escalator. Uh, so I would have wanted to see that different. I would have wanted to see investment in schools, hospitals, healthcare across the province that different. I want would have wanted, of course, downtown Calgary gets stiffed again. Um, Why do you say that? See. Because in the budget, and I'm just playing devil's advocate here for a second, <laughs> the, the 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 budget, according to their highlights, says three billion for for LRT in Edmonton and in Calgary. So that's expansion that's of not the, new. That's <laughs> not new. 
We put that money there. The, the NDP were the ones who committed $1.5 billion uh, in 2019 to see the green line put in, right? And the UCP delayed that for a year when they got in. And, and as, uh, Minister McIver delayed the whole thing. It was under uh, Premier Jason Kenney at the time. They did not mind pushing it off and saying, well, we got a study and blah, 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 blah. So what, what, what came out of that study? Nothing. Uh, delays came out of that study and, and more costs came out of that study. And, and 20,000 people didn't start to work uh, on, on that project a year uh, earlier because of the UCP. So, but those monies are already in the budget, Chris. They, they've been in their expected expenditures. It's like the Deerfoot or, you know, the LRT. Uh, those things have been thought of and, 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 and put in buckets to spend years ago. So that's not new. While it's not new, it is in the budget. That is correct. Yeah. We talk about Calgary and Edmonton a lot. But there's also other villages and towns in this province that make up this great province. Do you see anything that you can say, okay, the town of Edson, hypothetically, or the town of Vegreville, or the city of Brooks can hang their hat at and say, okay, they can help? Or what would you do as the NDP, if elected in May, to address these smaller communities? But Because while you are there to represent Calgary, you have to think about other communities as well. So how do you, as the Alberta NDP, see addressing issues that are hurting rural, small town communities like villages and towns? One thing we hear a lot about, I hear a lot about, is unpaid taxes in the uh, rural areas as a result of oil and gas uh, 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 some companies not paying their taxes, right? That directly affects uh, rural Alberta municipalities. So uh, we would sit down uh, with the, uh, municipalities, rural municipalities in particular, not, not Calgary and Edmonton. These are not things that affect them. Uh, so we would sit down with them and work through uh, that whole issue uh, uh, together. That would help the last time I heard the number, it was in the 245 to 285 uh, mil million dollars that weren't paid in taxes, which affects um, and, and causes them to raise their rate pay taxes on their rate payers, raise taxes, right? So we want we want uh, corporations to pay their taxes and where they're not paying them, uh, they need to, uh, they, that situation has to be dealt. So that would be new. The other thing is rural broadband in uh, across Alberta. We've got a strategy up on Alberta's uh, um, albertasfuture.ca, which talks about how rural broadband would roll out, uh, how we would invest in that, Chris. And uh, that's had uh, an endorsement from people in the business of broadband. So they, they get it, they understand it. The other thing we would do is not move forward with an Alberta police service or police force. That's something that this, this government has pushed off till after the election. They don't want it as an election issue, uh, just like they don't want health care to be an election issue um, uh, and their, their bad decision making around all of that. They're trying to say, oh, you know, health care is fixed, um, we're good, you know, don't worry about us. We're going to be there. We've given 5% more to health care in this province or health services in this province. Everything's good. Well, they cut billions out of health care. So 5% does not make up for what they cut. The, I, so I want to jump back. I want to jump back to the policing for a second, because the city of Grand Prairie just went through. Uh, a re, uh, they're going oh, through they that process. It. They haven't finished, yeah. but they're going through the process right now. Yeah. While you are not, while the Alberta NDP are not in favor of Alberta police force, are you in favor of municipalities looking into going to a municipal police force compared yeah. to a provincial? Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's anything, uh, certainly in the NDP platform, that says they can't look at that. They've always, smaller urban places or urban places have always had that uh, capability to examine that, uh, to see if that's in their best interests. Uh, but, but, you know, like um, small, small rural places, they don't have, they don't, they, they, they have the RCMP, right? And I know Grand Prairie has the RCMP at this time. So they're examining whether they want to change or not. Fine. 
take a look at it. I can tell you that Surrey in BC has looked at this and they decided to go down the road of a, of, of a, a municipal police force. A new council came in, the, the old one got unelected over this issue. New council came in and they said, whoa, this is going to cost all of us way more than we anticipated. So now they're looking at going back to the RCMP, which, you know, it's it's a cautionary tale, I guess, is you have to be careful what you wish for. Uh, and and so, no, we wouldn't we wouldn't change out the uh, the RCMP just because we want to kind of make a, a statement around um, uh, Ottawa's uh, fund, uh, Ottawa's in, involvement in Alberta. What what I know, uh, and certainly the RCMP Foundation has talked about, is that this is hundreds of millions of dollars that will have to be on the Alberta uh, dime and municipalities dime if uh, the uh, amount of money that the federal government regularly puts in every year to the RCMP is taken away. And the transition costs, you know, they're not going to hand over buildings, they're not going to hand over equipment. I mean, it's going to cost. And it's somewhere around, what is it, about $700, $700 million more the transition to an Alberta police service. Now, I want to ask one last question before I let you go here, Joe. And that question is this. Do municipalities have a friend in the Alberta NDP? And if so, how do you see yourself and your party see yourself if elected in May and you form government? working with municipalities from across Alberta to better their communities? Sure. Well, I can tell you, I'm, if we're fortunate enough to be elected in May, I am not the only person uh, on, in our caucus with municipal experience. Uh, there's probably half a dozen of us, which will hopefully be about 10% of our caucus uh, who will have direct experience at the municipal level for many, many years, and who uh, are on the side of municipalities, actually, because it is the, the, the level of government closest to the people, where you're working directly, people know you, they stop you in the grocery store, and they talk about their laneway, their garbage pickup, their, you know, their, their vision for the future. Um, that's, that's what the NDP brings uh, to uh, a government in May 29th. 2023. Now we welcome Alberta Party leader Barry Morishita. Mr. Morishita was the mayor of Brooks from 2010 to 2021 and has been a strong advocate for rural and small town communities in Alberta. He was elected leader of the Alberta Party in 2021. Barry, I, I've got to ask the question that is basically the premise of this entire series of this episode is, in your opinion, in the opinion of the Alberta Party, does Budget 2023 help or hinder the municipalities of Alberta? Uh, you know, I, I don't think it helps them at all, uh, especially from year to year. I don't think there's any really extra help. There are some areas where they've, you know, recognized some things and, and they've seen some increases in some individual um, areas such as wastewater and some other things. But overall, I don't think it puts uh, municipalities in a better position uh, funding wise, certainly, uh, as they were a year ago. Uh, one of the things that Alberta municipalities, an organization that you once headed as formerly the AUMA, uh, put out a press release late Wednesday afternoon saying that this budget falls short in the infrastructure area. $30 billion is what they're needing to uh, uh, effectively fix aging infrastructure. I'm hearing this when I'm doing my series on municipal leaders. Um how do we help uh, municipalities when it comes to infrastructure funding when we are in a boom and bust cycle? Well, I, well, I think first it, it starts with, you know, a meaningful partnership with municipalities. I, I don't think a lot of this can, you know, really be pushed along so that you see some progress done. So you have like longer term plans, uh, you know, uh, in order to address these needs. So it starts with the relationship. And, you know, when you look across the budget, there's a number of areas in the budget that indirectly or directly affect municipalities. There's very little municipal input into how those numbers are arrived at, 
what the impacts are, how the partnerships can be built, how we can become more efficient in delivering. So I think that's the that's the beginning. You got to have a start with a meaningful partnership. And you know, with my background, obviously, uh, I've recognized the potential of municipalities for a long, long time. And you know, it would start there. And then, and then, secondly, I think you really have to get down to how do you support municipalities so that they can deliver on the uh, the economic promises or the economic uh, possibilities and hope that uh, Albertans need to move forward, that they can do the community building that's necessary to, to provide quality of life. So people want to stay in Alberta. Uh, at the end of the day, that's where it has to happen. And I don't think there's a vision for a long-term funding. Um, you know, it was, it was great to see them take the indexing or the 50% growth cap off of the new LGFF. But the LGFF is, uh, you know, going to be, what, 30, 35% less than what the traditional support for the uh, old MSI program was. So, you know, we're talking about $300 million shortfall a, a year to start with. How long will that take to make up before you even get back to where we were 10 years ago? And, and that's not acceptable um, with inflation, population growth, infrastructure has gotten older. There's just not a pathway to progress there except on the backs of property tax owners. And I don't think that's really the, the right way to go. So I, I, you know, I think the, the LGFF should be, um, should start at that minimum uh, kind of traditional historical support for both those programs, which should, should be about a billion dollars. And then it should be indexed, uh, not just to the revenue growth of the province, I would argue that should be indexed to growth and uh, population rather than just the revenues of the province. Um, because if you decouple, if you decouple those things, you still have to prepare municipalities for growth in the years when things go down. So there has to be something along there. But um, you know, certainly, I don't think they're supported well enough in order to get the job done. And and that's going to be unfortunate because it's 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 not going to be better in five years under the program that's laid out there now. Now, the province will say that we are, we're, they are investing $6.9 billion over three years into municipal uh, funding and communities. $3 billion of that, though, goes directly to Edmonton and Calgary. While it is the largest uh, population centers, villages and towns and cities uh, that are not Edmonton and Calgary have to pick up the change. Um how do you see yourself and how would you would how would you have wanted the province to address smaller rural communities and smaller rural towns and villages when it came to this budget? Was there something that you wish they would have put in or even looked at a little bit more? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's disingenuous to, you know, put the big number out there. And Calgary and Edmonton need those those infrastructure pieces as well. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but again, um, if you're going to develop a relationship, there there are some significant issues in small communities that don't appear in a big community. When it comes to operating, when it comes to downloading costs, they just they have a you know an exponential impact in on smaller communities. And uh, I I don't think there's a lot of uh, a lot of things in the budget certainly, and certainly nothing in the in the new formula that allows that to be recognized and those issues to be dealt with. Um, you know, I, I think we need to do a couple of things to make that better. I think we need to provide a lot more tools and, uh, you know, incentives. Do you, do you, what what to, are those tools? I apologize to interrupt, but what, yeah, are those no, tools no, that, think, what are those tools that you're looking at potentially because you are a leader of a party, you are potentially uh, in the running to be the next premier of Alberta. What tools would you and the Alberta party bring to the table to help municipalities, big and small? Well, I think, I think, first of all, I think, you know, we have to take a regional approach to a lot of these issues. Um, you know, the, there's a general affordability cost crisis when it comes to infrastructure. And, it, and it, you know, the cost of recreation centers and roads and, and big infrastructure is so, so hard to deal with when you're a small community. I think we have to look at how we partner in our regional municipalities, how we work together. And I think for tools, I mean, I think... You know, we don't, uh, right now, we only have a couple of tools. We've got the um, intermunicipal collaboration agreements, which are, you know, which are a good start, but but aren't the best thing. Um, and then beyond that, you know, you have to dissolve and amalgamate and there's nothing in between there. So I would, I would, I would hope that we would, as a government would give uh, regional municipality, municipalities an opportunity 
to re retain their identity, to retain autonomy, but also to, to be in more meaningful partnerships uh, when it comes to dealing with infrastructure costs. I think the province has to support them at a higher level. Um, and, you know, I, I can't say this enough. Everything stops there. If houses aren't being built in Calgary or Brooks or Grand Prairie or Beaumont, uh, there isn't places for people to live. People can't afford to be in Alberta. Then companies can't afford to move to Alberta. So there, we have to work together on this. We can't take a siloed approach to everything. You know, we can't inject uh, millions and billions of dollars in economic growth without talking about what are the responsibilities uh, flowing downhill to municipalities when it comes to water and wastewater, um, recreation and parks and uh, costs of that nature. You know, simple quality of life things, uh, things you need necessary, garbage pickup, police services, fire departments. All of that has to be brought into, you know, context with growth. And if you leave one behind, then you're going to drive up costs. If you drive up costs to the point where nobody wants to live in Alberta or can't afford to live in Alberta, you're going to stop the economic engine. So, you know, again, comes back to relationships. So the, some of the tools we would be is that we would have to work together, work together on school sites, work together on, on how you fund those, those pieces and take a longer term, less political view on how to fund infrastructure. I think municipalities, uh, you know, we always want to get our own projects done, of course, and the nature of the grant system, uh, the nature of uh, the competitiveness of uh, available money makes it very difficult for small communities. I think that there should be um, separate opportunities so that, a, you know, a community with one staff member isn't competing with a community that has, uh, you know, a grant writer and three engineers on staff and community develop has a lot more administrative horsepower. So I think there has to be some reconciliation there. Uh, but primarily, municipalities know what they need, and and the province has an obligation to get in the room and sit with them and and work that out over a long period of time. And it starts with funding first. One of the things that I've been hearing in the, the cross border interview series, where I sit down with municipal leaders, is uh, just that sustainable growth, but also when it comes to retention and attraction of residents to the community. While this budget presents that we're giving $6.9 billion to municipalities over three years, how do you see your role and the role of the provincial government in helping municipalities retain and uh, attract residents? Because I'm just using your words here, but you said funding should go where the growth is. And if people are losing community members are you saying that they shouldn't go there the money shouldn't flow to these communities or are you saying it should i just want to be clear here yeah yeah so so there's no doubt about it that you you have to fund growth uh, in order to become uh, in, in order to ensure economic growth so growth in municipalities has to however there has been a disregard for the base core infrastructure in a community in order to keep a community whole now you know uh the way the modernity of the of the planet has changed over time, there are going to be casualties in all this in terms of, you know, whether you're an independent corporate entity or not. But communities don't disappear uh, on their own just simply because, uh, you know, uh, there's some infrastructure needs that are unmet. What I mean by that is that is that communities themselves have to be recognized for the value they serve the province. And again, in a collaborative way. So we have hubs of communities that serve, uh, you know, rural farming communities that are small, but are service hubs. And then the province arbitrarily cuts, uh, you know, education funding or school funding or neglects school builds. And then pretty soon the school board's forced to close schools and pretty soon there's no school. Uh, we know in primary care, as an example, these are the types of things I'm talking about what the province needs to get their heads wrapped around and recognize that there are some basic needs that the province is solely responsible for, but they need to work in partnership with communities to preserve them. So basic health care, primary care is a really good example. Um, schools and access to education. Uh, communities can't exist without some basic things. And when decisions are made so far away from those individual communities, I think at times you, you make a lot of mistakes and we've seen communities suffer. And what is the kind of heartbreaking thing about all this, Chris, is that if you go to a community and say, hey, you know what, your, your, your school population is, 
is a bit low for our model. You know, what can we do together to make sure that we're still supporting this agricultural community uh, so that we have workers and we have services for this? How, how do we work together? And, you know, I don't know of a single municipality that I've ever visited. And I, as you know, I've visited a lot of them. Those pins are all behind me here on the wall. Um, that wouldn't step up and say, you know what, I think we could help you. And I've been to communities where they only had funding for half a gymnasium and where a community of a couple hundred raised them a couple million dollars to make it a full-size gymnasium. So the school had an opportunity to have sports and a place for the community. Yeah, there's so much potential, uh, but we have to get out there and recognize it and preserve communities uh, in a collaborative way. Um, quit trying to stamp them all the same. So we got to open up the box, as I said, tools before. Not everything has to look the same, but we do have to preserve some basic services in order to preserve those communities. And that's something the province has not taken seriously for a very long time. One of those basic services that a lot of municipalities are facing right now is rural health. Uh, I was just speaking uh, recently with someone in the rural uh, rural Alberta, and they said that one of their hospitals has closed uh, at night and there's no emergency access. And people have to drive almost two hours or even to Saskatchewan to get proper health care or emergency health care, which is over an hour away. How do municipalities look at this issue and look at the government and say, okay, we need help here? How do you see yourself and the Alberta Party addressing rural health when it comes to helping municipalities staff their hospitals, but also ensuring that a person doesn't have to drive to Saskatchewan to get health care needs in an emergency manner? So, so I think there's First, we gotta we gotta recognize where we are, and and I think that's one thing municipalities do better than anybody. So we know there's not a short, you know, this isn't going to be fixed overnight, but there are some things we can do. But they're not the same things over and over again, Chris. We can't just, um, you know, add money to the pot and then expect people to magically appear uh, in primary care or in hospitals in in um, in rural Alberta. And by rural, I'm I'm using that word pretty broadly because I mean outside of the bigger centers, right? Um, so we've got to come up with some long-term ways to deal with it. I think we we can explore, um, you know, paying for people's education in exchange for service contracts. Because I think if a lot of people um, on the healthcare side, once they get to small communities, you know, you don't keep everybody, but man, I, I've seen so many people who planned on being most of these communities for a year or two and end up staying in the community for 20 years. Uh, so I think we have to expose them to that. I think we need a rural pre-med program that allows uh, better pathways for rural and indigenous uh, people, students to get into medicine um, uh, because they typically, a lot of them want to come back and serve their communities because their communities are what gave them all of the opportunities they had in the face. We're not doing anything in that area. I think we have to recognize that um, the quality of life for people uh, in those fields is different and that we have to adjust to those new workplace realities. So uh, we, we, again, we have to be flexible. And I think we have to allow different models of uh, primary care to exist. Uh, you know, I've talked with a lot of doctors and a lot of nurses and a lot of community members about that. You know, I don't think one model, again, fits in every rural community. Sometimes the assets they possess you know, lend themselves to a certain solution, but the solution can't be kind of uh, put together because the rules don't allow it. And I think we have to take off some of the binding of those rules and allow communities to do their own workforce planning, perhaps, uh, decide what they can and can't help pay for or what uh, what's available. So how do they do it? Again, let's unleash some innovation. There's lots of it uh, in uh, communities across this province, particularly smaller ones, who want to make sure their health care is preserved. They want to make sure that they can get uh, emergency care. They're realistic. They recognize that, you know, they've chosen to live there and that they have some compromises to make. But at the same time, I think Alberta has enough wealth and we have enough goodwill at the community level. We can make this happen. We just have to be innovative and open-minded about some of those solutions. And the Alberta Party uh, understands that. Would municipalities have a friend or a partner in the Alberta Party if elected? I think without a question, because, you know, uh, one of the things the Alberta Party really believes in is, is leveraging all of the uh, assets that the province has. 
and I don't think anyone uh, and more than I know about the potential uh, assets, the potential production, the potential uh, solutions that municipalities bring to the table. Um, and it would be, uh, they would certainly have a friend in the Alberta party for that, because I think uh, you'd see a lot of problems be solved uh, because those solutions are going to be initiated at a much more local level than they currently are. Now, our next guest is Kathy Heron, the president of the Alberta Municipalities. Mayor Heron has been serving as the mayor of the city of St. Albert since 2017 and has been an active member of the Alberta Urban Municipality Association's AUMA since 2017. She was elected as the first president of Alberta Municipalities in 2021 when they went through a name change and has been working tirelessly to advance the interest of municipalities across the province. I want to start with my very first question that I've been posing to every guest that's come on from the minister to the municipal affairs critic to yourself, to Paul, the president of uh, rural municipalities. In your opinion and the opinion of Alberta municipalities, was budget 2023 that was presented uh, earlier this week good for municipalities? I would say overall, yes. Um, there was there was two, I would say, two significant things that stand out in my head. The first was um, the LGFF legislation is going to be amended to allow for um, the growth of the infrastructure plot to grow at the same rate as provincial revenues. I think probably others have mentioned that too. But um, the LGFF is, is the transition away from MSI, which is our grant that gives us infrastructure funding. And um, the big advantage of LGFF over MSI was the fact that it um, is legislated. And so, you know, it's kind of, um, it allows for predictability of funding for municipalities. MSI generally was, we would hold our breath every budget and see what they would randomly throw into the pot. And so now it's legislated in formula. So that's good news. The problem with the current legislation is that um, it links the growth of the pot to provincial revenue, which we wanted, uh, but it only grows the pot at half the rate of revenue. Now it's uh, Rebecca Schultz has uh, promised to open the legislation and make it grow at 100% of provincial revenue, which um, I guess it puts uh, municipalities in a, a very much more of a partnership relationship with the province rather than this child of the province relationship. So we will, you know, benefit in growth of the economy, but we will also, you know, tighten our belts and um, and see decreases if the economy does take a downturn. So it, it, I feel it's very fair. Does that allow municipalities to plan better, in your opinion? Because I can, I can imagine when you have a partnership that is equal and not a child partnership, it yeah. gives the municipalities, uh, whether it be a small town like the town of Manning or a rural community, a better chance to plan for the future. We are required to do, uh, I think it's three-year operating and five-year. We're required to do multi-year budgets, and so we need that predictability while we budget out and there's many municipalities in Alberta that are moving towards multi-year budgets and so they need to know what number to put in that revenue column so yes this uh, the formula allows us to take the past three years of provincial revenue and that and so we know what we we know what happened three years ago so we know what our what we're going to get next year for funding so it's great for predictability now in this uh, in this series that I've been putting together for about municipal elected leaders from across Alberta and across Canada, I've been asking them the uh, councillors, mayors, Reeves the same question. I'm assuming you're asking them as well the same question. What is the biggest issue that is facing your municipality? And the common theme I'm hearing over and over and over again is infrastructure. Aging infrastructure is a big concern for them because right. yeah. there's a lot of budget and infrastructure costs a lot of money. Does, mm -hmm. does this budget, in your opinion, help municipalities address the aging infrastructure issues that they're facing today? Not as much as we would have liked. So although I can speak um, fondly and glowingly of that change in legislation, it, it's still the, the, the starting number of $722 million is well below what we need. Uh, the MSI grant was originally promised to deliver well about 1.4 or 1.2 to 1.4 billion. 
and we never we never received that kind of funding. It just that promise was never kept. So we've done that some initial calculations on what that would have looked like if you know given inflation. Uh, we've looked at how much infrastructure we have, et cetera. We th we think we need about one point seven billion, and we're getting seven twenty two. So uh, it's it's not enough. And municipalities are responsible for sixty percent of public infrastructure in this province. Yet we we you know represent about a one percent um, line item in this budget. So it's it's not nearly enough. And I and I get that we need to build schools and we need to build hospitals. Those are provincial infrastructure, and those are really important. But at the same time, we also need to build rec facilities and we also need to build fire halls, um, et cetera. And those are municipal responsibility and those are not being addressed. So how are we supposed to attract workforce and foreign investment when we can't provide that quality of life? And as you probably well know that the only other way for us to raise revenue is property taxes, which is not positive um, positive measure, especially when we're trying to think of affordability in this province and we're trying to consider attracting, um, you know, bigger corporations to come to Alberta. And so we've got to keep those business property taxes down. So it, it we're, we're going to struggle with infrastructure. And uh, is this a short term even, struggle or is this a long term struggle? Do you think it's it's a long term one? Yeah, we, I think there's a 30 billion dollar deficit that we've estimated in, in infrastructure in Alberta. And of course, the inflation right now and the cost of boring is another huge um, issue for us, because although we could go into debt for some of this stuff, it's it's not a, not the right time for that. You, you, you mentioned something I want to also pick up on is about growth. Sustainable growth is a big concern. A lot of municipalities because with the attraction and retention of communities and people in the communities is a big concern for smaller communities, whether it be the town of Manning, which I spoke to, or Edson, I spoke to as well, the mayor's there. And they're saying that sustainable growth is a big concern. How do you see yourself as Alberta municipalities and yourself as the president working with the provincial government with this budget to try to address that issue? Because you have put out a press release Wednesday afternoon addressing this issue. How do we do it? <laughs> that's a good question i think you know it's just about the relationship and so i, I, I do you have a good relationship with this government right now uh i believe so i quite like our minister our municipal affairs she's very approachable i think she understands she's working very hard and she's visiting those towns and villages that you've mentioned so that's very much appreciated she will be at the rural municipalities association uh convention later this month She's coming to our mid-sized mayor's caucus in Cochrane. She's coming to the Alberta municipalities. She's working very hard. So, you know, she's she's new in, in the role, but she's learning. And I think she's getting a bigger un better understanding. And I think she's advocating very hard on behalf of municipalities when she gets to Treasury Board. So I think that is hugely advantageous. Yep. But going back to the original question about that growth, um, how do you how is Alberta municipalities going to have to try to address this issue with this this budget that they've just presented yeah well one of the next steps for lgff and that and taking that pot of money and how we allocate it out between each community is we are you know our association is really trying to um push for a lot of the funding to go to those communities that have growth in population instead of um you know the, our, the rural municipalities uh, would rather see the the funding get distributed you know by kilometers of road is quite often what they um, use as their factor. But I think growth in population is where the money should be going. There's some communities, especially some of the mid-sized cities, Cochrane and Airdrie, for example, are growing at an astronomical rate, like over 10%. It's crazy. And I don't know how they're going to keep up with the infrastructure. So they need they need significant more support. And then you're right, they've got those towns like Edson and Manning who, if they don't get the funding, then they will lose population. and but there's jobs there and there's industry there. And so they need labor. And so if we don't support those communities to keep the housing supply up, to keep the roads uh, from crumbling under them, to keep you know the sewer and water running to their houses, those are, the, those are municipal infrastructures. They're not sexy, they're not schools and hospitals, but they're in required infrastructure in Alberta. And so they need support. Other, otherwise this economy that, um, that we're really trying to grow in Alberta is going to fail. 
you you talk about the sexiness of uh, municipal politics and it is one of those weird uh envelopes that you open and you have to peek inside from time to time when issues like roads start crumbling the provincial government doesn't hear about it you hear about it your exactly. constituents your local elected leaders hear about it while this is what you get this is the budget as presented this is what you have to play with now What's the next steps Alberta Municipalities has to do? Is it sit down with your colleagues, the board, and say, okay, what, what's our next steps here? Or is it now looking at what you just said? Where's the areas of growth that we need to advocate for and put the money towards and sort of, and I hate to say this, but pick the winners and losers. Yeah, and, and I don't want, I don't, that's ex the exact thing I want to prevent. And so we've been working really hard on a project called the Future of Municipal Government, and we've been we've um, we've asked the Calgary School of Public Policy to write a number of white papers on on ideas of what the future will look like, how we can how we can finance ourselves differently, how we can structure ourselves differently and govern, and you know so I, I would very much ra rather work with Rural Municipalities Association and my association so we can share in that limited pot of money and so there's so there's a better understanding of uh, from my point of view how much it costs to uh maintain hundreds of kilometers of gravel road which is what the municipalities of you know the rurals have to do and 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 there's there's struggles with not collecting oil and gas municipal taxes from, you know from just delinquent landowners so those are struggles that i don't really understand but i think if we work together i could you know we could probably have a better way of, of funding each other and, and when some of the big industrial developments land in the rural communities and they bring in, you know, a lot of, of cash, how does that rural community then support their local neighboring town or village in, in building a new playground? Those kind of things. I think that is honestly the solution in our future is working better together between municipalities. I want to end on this question because I think this is the most important question. While the budget is presented as is, what would you wish was in it? What would you have wished that the provincial government would have went a little bit further? Is it that grant? Is it that $1.3 million? Is it that $30 billion infrastructure deficit that you're seeing over the next few years? What would Alberta municipalities wanted to have seen in this budget? I'll, I'll point out one thing. Sorry to not answer your question directly, but there was one other thing in the budget that was really a good and positive surprise was the infrastructure grant, whether it be MSI or LGFF, has a small piece that's called uh, operating. So most of the grant goes to infrastructure and capital projects, but there's a small operating grant in there and they doubled that. So from 30 million to 60 million. So uh, for example, St. Albert, my municipality gets around 400 plus thousand dollars a year from that grant now it's doubled so i'll get about 900 so that's that's unexpected we didn't ask for that but will be put to good use to help um offset some of our operating expenses so i just wanted to add that in but yes i think the question you you just asked what would be the biggest ask would have been more money in the infrastructure pot i think that would have signaled um the minister the, the provincial government's understanding of our issue if they could just um add to that pot uh and put it back where where they promised it to be, and it wasn't this government; it was many years ago. But where we've we've tried to demonstrate the need, uh, that would have been the biggest win for us. Okay, I know I said that was my last question, but I have a follow up okay. to that. We have a provincial election coming up. You are the president of Alberta Municipalities. What issues are you going to be raising hell about over the next few months to make sure that the provincial party leaders, whether it be Rachel Notley, Daniel Smith, are addressing at the uh, min, uh, provincial level when it comes to municipalities? There's a lot. The infrastructure funding will be the first and foremost on our mind when we walk into either either party's office. Uh, we, work, we work with both. Honestly, we do. And um, we met with uh, Joe Cece just a couple of weeks ago. So, he, so they can hopefully get some of the municipal issues into their platform and policies. The partnership that I've mentioned before is is huge to us. We want um, whoever is forming government to really show some respect to the to the locally elected. We're duly elected. Um, I know we have to exist under provincial legislation, but we don't want anybody tramping uh, on our on our zone of uh, authority. 
And so that kind of autonomy is really important to us. Infrastructure funding. And I think the other big one for us in many ways is uh, healthcare, mostly around ambulance. And there was some significant money in the budget for recommendations coming out of the, I'm going to get this wrong, Alberta Emergency or Alberta EMS Provincial Advisory Committee. It was called APEC. And uh, both Paul McLaughlin and myself sat on that as the leaders of our association, because this is a big issue, is getting an ambulance to your house. Whether you're in Edmonton, St. Albert, or in a far distant um, rural town or rural county. So they've invested money in that. And I want to make sure that that there is a solution coming out of the provincial government election. Sorry, out of the election. I'd like to now welcome our last guest to today's show. Paul McLaughlin, the president of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. Reeve McLaughlin is the Reeve of Pinoca County and has been an active member of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta for many years. He is a strong voice for rural communities in Alberta. So, Paul, I, I guess I got to start off with the first question. In the opinion of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta, how does Budget 2023 stand up from the provincial government that was tabled earlier this week? You know, it, it's uh, I'll give you the sandwich. So two pieces of bread, the meat in the middle. So uh, positive things, you know, if we're, if we're playing rural bingo, this budget had the rural said the most times of any budget in my memory. So uh, rural investment. So I, I would I commend the government looking at uh, parts of, of rural crime, fighting rural crime, uh, key investments of rural health care. Um, they really stood out to us. So definitely uh, positive from that perspective. Uh, the meat in the middle, which is 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 the bad part, is that uh, we've actually received in 2020, we had pretty much the largest single sector budget cut in 2020. And I know things were tough in 2020, but uh, our sector received probably, I would say, roughly a billion dollar haircut. Take or give it. Um, that's been entrenched in this budget. So from an infrastructure investment standpoint, we're the folks that build the roads, uh, you know, rural municipalities specifically, we're the largest asset holder of any municipalities across Canada. So if you compare us to any other municipalities, we have the most road and bridge infrastructure of any municipalities. So the other part of the sandwich, the positive part, the other piece of bread, uh, things like FCSS, uh, you know, family community support services, those investments I think were recognized by this government is very important. Investment in libraries, those are positive. We also have a very rural unique uh, budget item, which is called STEP, so strategic transformation uh, infrastructure. That funding, they've actually supported and added some money to it. Those build our bridges. And I think that the best way to give you an example about rural Alberta is uh, on the Reeve of Pinoca County. I have 160 bridges in Pinoca County. Uh, average bridge replacement at about a million dollars. It's $160 million infrastructure liability to my community. So this step funding every three years, this gives us an opportunity at least to uh, to help us replace one bridge, which when you're looking at $160 million uh, bridge liability, that's very beneficial. So, you know, I, it's okay. It's, it, you know, would I, would I say it's the best budget ever? I understand there's a lot of hands out, but I'll tell you the, uh, the importance of rural infrastructure. That's how we get goods to market. That's how we feed people. That's where the energy comes from. So our infrastructure is pretty important to make Alberta work. So I want to use your analogy against you here for a second. So I want to stick with the meat of your sandwich, because I've been talking to uh, many of your colleagues in counties and MDs across this great province for our, our uh, segment on our show where we sit down with local leaders. And what I'm hearing, and I'm assuming you're hearing the same thing, is that infrastructure, is the aging infrastructure uh, concern that they have. This budget, it does go in partnership with the new LGFF, if I'm making sure I get that right here uh funding yep. for 2024 2025 but in 2023 you still have the msi which sees a slight increase but the lgff sees a decrease over the year while budget 2023 is tough for a lot of rural municipalities how is it going to be in 2024 with this new funding uh, equation that the province has announced uh this week well that you know it's really i'll use the word entrenching again so it's really entrenching a significant, probably roughly a billion dollar cut to, to those dollars we use for infrastructure. So it's significant. Um, it's a step backwards uh, for rural municipalities. Uh, that funding is, is critical to us. We have aging infrastructure. Uh, and what rural Alberta is about is low population, high infrastructure. We have a lot of roads and not a lot of people. And and so, yeah, we're going to step backwards. And and I think it's, it's really important if you want to play the long game, uh, if we want to build Alberta, 
um, that funding is critical to, to keeping their, our roads together. So what would you have rather have seen? What would you want in this budget that was not presented in this budget? And by you, I mean the rural municipalities of Alberta. Well, it's really the need to be made whole again. Um, and, and back in the day, MSI, the Municipal Sustainability Initiative, was actually designed actually to replace the property tax room that goes to education. It was It was actually to give us that prop, that tax room back. So imagine on your bill on a, on a uh, rural acreage, uh, education property tax comes on it. That's tax room that is lost to us that we could use. And so it was recognized by Stelmac back in the day that, hey, wait a minute, you know, we're pulling this money out of your municipalities, we're pulling out this tax room, so we'll use MSI. And the purpose of MSI was to make communities sustainable. So if the whole intent of the program is to make communities sustainable, and you cut the program to make them sustainable, you will have unsustainable municipalities. And so I think that if you have this belief that you want to continue moving up and forward and growing, uh, that's probably about the worst budget to cut if that's your intent. You you talked about one of the pieces of bread in your uh, hypothetical sandwich being rural crime and policing. This budget allocates a a bit of an increase to municipalities and rural communities looking at transitioning away from the RCMP. Are you happy and could it have been more? Well, you know, in the transitioning away from RCMP, the majority of our members, uh, that's not something that's even showing up on their radar. Really? Um, That is a very, yeah, it's not, not, none of the municipalities, the only way that the, the members that I have, the members that I have, the majority of them, we actually have a resolution that says to stay with the RCMP. So transitioning away from RCMP isn't on the radar for 80 to 90% of the municipalities I represent. And if they started to create a provincial police force, if we were forced down that path, um, then maybe some of my members would take that on. Here's the conversation. So to fight crime. Okay, here I am, I'm talking to you. Literally, I cannot see a house anywhere. Chris, there is no houses to be seen. You could have three officers patrolling this area. I'm sitting here right now. I'm not seeing any officers. This isn't about quantity policing. The conversation around rural crime is the same 10 people. We have repeat offenders. Uh, Rural Alberta is very vulnerable to repeat offenders. And we need to have that conversation around. around, And that's what my members are saying. Let's deal with addictions. Let's deal with with, a revolving door. Let's deal with judicial reform. That's where you should put the energy. And that's what my, my folks now, I will say that in the budget, they did increase, uh, they did make those investments in, in the legal system. Critically important. The backlog is so bad that a lot of folks are just laughing because they're walking away because they can't actually get before a hearing in time. Uh, and there's a lot of folks that get released on the same day just because we don't have the mechanisms in place. So dealing with those pieces, that's how you deal with real crime. You know, you can have 15 officers in my nearest town and 15 officers in my nearest town are the same distance away as one officer in my nearest town. This isn't about this isn't about quantity, uh, and we've got right now. We feel we've got pretty good quality with the RCMP that we have right now. One of the other issues that I've been hearing from members of colleagues of yours, whether it be from Flagstaff County or from Clearwater County, when I sit down with them, is sustainable growth. They need retention and attraction of residents, and they need to make sure that the people who are leaving are replaced by people who are coming in. Does this budget lay out any help for rural municipalities and counties and MDs who are facing residential shortages when people are leaving and no one's coming to fill those spaces? Well, there's there's a few pieces to it. I think that living rurally is a lifestyle choice. Um, I'm the I, I'm the Reeve of Pinocchio County. Uh, you think people would move to Pinocchio County? They want to ask how amazing the Reeve is and how low the taxes are. The number one question they ask in Pinocchio County is broadband access. So this government has made those investments in broadband, and I will commend them because that is one piece to keeping people in rural rural areas. Um, edu- investment in schools, I think, is important, and school transportation has become a big issue, and you've seen those increases. Um, at the same time, rural is a lifestyle choice, and uh, it's really a conversation around making sure that we've got the infrastructure and the quality of services. If you're attracting an individual to a neighbor to a community to actually have them employed in your community. Um, It's important to recognize that they have a partner or a spouse that needs to have employability as well. But what we are seeing, though, is we are seeing entrepreneurship growing in rural Alberta. And I think this is tied to to broadband. Um, Mom and pop shops showing up. Uh, People actually are making choices and moving to our municipalities out of the larger centers because they're realizing that, hey, you know what? If I've got access to a post office and I've got broadband, I can actually make a living doing that. And I think that exists. 
and we need to still build upon that and provide those services as well. Um, when I first moved to my neighborhood, my school was going to go down. They were talking about not enough kids and, and, and there's just, there's the schools aren't populated enough. And then since then we've actually seen a population increase. And also what I've noticed is during COVID, I've seen a population increase too. So I think people had some time to kill. There's a lot of babies around if you've noticed. Um, but I think it's important to understand that, that I think that, uh, it's the building communities that are important. And I'll, I'll actually do a shout out to libraries and, and FCSS. So the, the family community support services. So this is really our social services in rural Alberta. You cannot, you cannot even imagine how amazing of an organization that these folks do because they're the social safety net. They deal with the mental health. They deal with, with, with seniors. They actually collect all these pieces and they provide us tremendous service. And I think supporting agencies like that, those are what keeps communities together. The other interesting thing is that the investment, increased investment in ag service boards uh, if you want to talk about a volunteer run organizations that are the glue of rural Alberta, it's the Ag Services Boards and those community centers. Those things are still the hubs of our communities. Uh, the volunteerism in those areas are critically important, and that's how you build community. So those are where the investment should lie. What's next for the RMA? What's next for the RMA when in regards to this budget? Is there, I know there is a provincial election coming up here, but what do you do in the short term to A, ensure that the RMA gets their fair shot at this uh, budget funding that the province has put out? Because I know you're up against Alberta municipalities, but what does RMA have to do now to make sure that they get their fair cut of the pot? Well, and it's telling our story. So uh, the growth of, of renewables, for example, we're, we're the hub of renewable growth. Um, we've heard more, what we've learned through COVID is agriculture, quite honestly, agriculture is our future. It was our past and it's our future. Agri-textiles, investment in agriculture. So recognizing that what comes with that, uh, ag investment comes with that is the infrastructure attached to it. And that infrastructure story is made, it's what's made us successful as Alberta uh, and it needs to continue forward. We need to continue to tell our story. You know, we represent 15% of the population, 85% of the land base. Um, we manage our rural municipals, our tight-fisted rural municipal leaders do amazing with what the money they get. Uh, they do amazing, they provide tremendous service and though they need to be supported. You can't always look at the big centers as the growth of, of the economy. And if you look at most of the big uh, announcements that have been made from, from investment standpoint, if you notice those have been all been in rural Alberta. So I think a lot of cases you're seeing that we've got some opportunities here that we need to leverage and continue on. So we'll keep telling our story. Uh, we'll keep be saying, you know what, the fact is, is that we shouldn't step backward, we should step forward. Uh, and we're the type of folks that we're solution focused. So we're not hand out. Trust me, you give a dollar to a rural municipal leader, they're going to spend it wisely because I got to go to the feed store. And if I do something stupid, guess what I hear about it. I, I'm hearing that a lot from a lot of your colleagues from rural Alberta on the show. Um, I want to end on this question, though. What issue are you going to be pushing forward in uh, the 2023 municipal, uh, provincial election? I apologize uh, when it comes to rural municipalities and where the parties stand. Well, we got we got three pieces of the pie that we're pushing through and we're actually arming our members. And, and I hope you get an opportunity to see what we're doing, because we want to have that local conversation with MLAs and candidates. Regardless, and we're a nonpartisan organization. Probably first and foremost on the top of my list is unpaid oil and gas taxes. That has been uh, a, a perennial uh, issue for us. Uh, next week, we'll be coming out with our third annual unpaid tax uh, notification. Uh, that needs to be fixed. We're also concerned about the quasi judicial board, so the AER, NRCB. These are organizations that are making land use decisions in rural Alberta. Um, that we need to start to recognize that we need to make sure that we're making good choices. So, for example, uh, solar, putting solar in an area that's high-end agricultural land, is that the best place to put solar installations? And instead, should it be on more marginal land or land that doesn't uh, cause a food security issue? So those are the type of conversations we're having. And I think really what we want to be recognized is that we're a partner in the development of Alberta, uh, but our expertise is land use planning in our municipalities. I need to recognize that we are part of, part of that whole puzzle. Uh, we're experts in it. It's not an easy job to say yay or nay on projects in, in rural Alberta, but it's important to understand that we're actually the experts in it and we make some good decisions that are that are basically community focused. And so our hope is that this uh, through this election, we're considered a partner, we have a voice and we're recognized for what we do, which is, is make good decisions from land use from rural Albertans. So we provide the food, the energy, and we try to keep the water clean. And uh, that's what we do. I'm going to ask a political question here, and I apologize for throwing it out of left field here, but Paul, I feel like you're up for it. Do you feel like you have your partner in this relationship right now? 
Uh, I, I do. Uh, definitely, I do. I feel that this government does recognize us. I do have the level of participation that we need in most cases. Um, do we have the level of importance that I think we should have? I think in many ways we're taken for granted. Um, and I think that sometimes we, uh, sometimes we need to re remind people who we are and what we're about and not be take it for granted. But uh, I, I feel we've got a voice with this government. It, it ebbs and flows. Um, at the same time, I think it's interesting because sometimes uh, I can be critical of government in general. And, uh, and often people are saying, well, you know, you're starting to sound like the opposition. I said, no, my job isn't to be the opposition to this government. My, my job is to identify issues that are tied to rural Albertans, all rural Albertans, and make sure that that voice is part of the, part of the discussion. So, um, and the other thing too, is that I try to remind the odd Mr. and the odd MLA is, it's a good idea to talk to a rural Albertan if you think an idea is stupid or not, because we're pretty good at telling you stupid. And, uh, and our hope is, is going forward that uh, people start to recognize that, you know what, if you're going to do something, maybe you should come talk to us first. I want to take a moment and thank our guests for sharing their insights and perspectives with us. We have discussed a lot over the last hour, but I also want to take a moment and thank you for watching. We have discussed how this recent budget announcement may address some of the issues we have been hearing about on the cross-border interviews when we sit down with local elected leaders from Alberta. Overall, I hope this special episode provided a valuable platform for a meaningful discussion on the future of municipalities and rural communities in Alberta. So until next time, remember, just keep talking.